very hard to define autism. Autism is a way of being in the world. It's a way of processing the things that come into your body, the lights and the sounds and so on. Autism affects how you perceive other people and how you interact with other people. Differences in how, how your brain plans and manages activities and organising that information and translating it into behaviour. And if that's different from the way it seems most people do it, that's really interesting. The study that we're running is to look at social intelligence in autism. We were interested to find out whether there are differences in how autistic people interact with other autistic people than to how they interact with non-autistic people. Autistic people spend an awful lot of time pretending to be not autistic because we have to, to survive in society. Trying to be like other people and behave the way they do, look the way they do, so that people don't call us out on our weirdness. Oh no, is this person going to see that I'm really weird now? What, what are they expecting of me? So doing a lot of kind of maybe simulating of what another person might expect and what you should say in that circumstance. So it's quite tiring to kind of Always do the masking. Yeah. If I was my authentic autistic self, I'll, I'll be fidgeting, moving an awful lot more. Um, it involves a lot less eye contact because um, I find that quite painful. I don't know, it's, it's hard not to resort to sort of terms like acting normal. It used to be that autism was this kind of very rare condition diagnosed in childhood that was kind of really related to slow language development, intellectual disabilities alongside that. As we've kind of progressed through the years, kind of also included those who have normal speech through to people who have long-term partners and friends and children and fantastic and colleagues and fantastic relationships, but still might find that their interactions are atypical in various ways. On paper, my life was very successful, although behind that, you know, there were some difficulties. So I didn't know I was autistic until I was 42. Um, so I've had decades of you know, working at just mirroring what people around me are doing. You know, when I have someone coming round, even for, for coffee, I'll, I have not mild panic attacks, but I have to really deep breathe, think clearly, not worry, manage anxiety. I think anxiety is a key thing. We use the phrase the autism spectrum. Unfortunately, it's become used in a very linear way. So people talk about being at one end of the spectrum, meaning people whose support needs seem to be very, very high versus people who seem to have less need for support. We really need to think of autism more as a constellation, and that's the term that we're trying to use now. There's been a 119% increase in autism since the year 2000 and experts still have no clue what's causing it. The umbrella that contains autism has got a lot bigger. That's probably one of the big drivers of what people think are increasing prevalence rates of autism, but are actually really increasing rates of diagnosis. Certainly the word epidemic is, is not appropriate. Epidemic implies disease, so it plays into various false narratives about autism. There are thousands of parents who are all saying that the MMR is to blame for their children's autism. I believe vaccinations triggered Evan's autism. The false connection that's made between vaccines and autism, for example, these things have been really disproven in good quality epidemiological studies. A new large study finds the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine does not increase the risk of autism. We definitely know that autism is genetically mediated, but it's not heritable exactly. So it runs in families, but not in a predictable way. I think we'd certainly not say that autism is a disease at all. In terms of whether we're looking at it as a deficit or a, or a disability, I think that's a very kind of central question to the research that we're doing. Disorder still in the manuals, but I personally hope that we're probably going to move away from that. Disability and difference, I would say yes, both. I think it's important to understand that things can be a difference but still have disabling aspects to them. People can have gastrointestinal issues and you know cognitive issues, mental health issues alongside autism that are very disabling. Imagine if a way, if, if this is the way you are but you've been told your whole life that it's a problem and a disease and it's wrong and you're, you know, like, you're disordered in some way. That's not going to do anyone any good in terms of, like, 
just actually being a happy person. And, and none of this is about denying that autism isn't disabling for everyone at some time. So even those that appear the most, you know, less severely impacted, there are situations where the sensory or social or anxiety, which where you are, you are sort of disabled. And these can vary in severity for different people. Okay, so we'll all just make towers. So I'm gonna to give you each a little handful of spaghetti. We decided to focus in on information transfer, so the way in which people transmit information to each other. Eight people came in and essentially you would teach the first person in the chain something and they would demonstrate it to the next person in the chain and so on for eight people. So we've had groups of people who are autistic, we've had groups of people who are non-autistic and we've had groups of people that have had both autistic and non-autistic people in them and in those chains we've alternated between a non-autistic person and an autistic person in the chain. One of the inclusion criteria that we had was that people uh, who were participating had to have an IQ of more than 70. And the reason that we did that is because this is a very new, very experimental piece of research and we wanted to minimise the amount of noise in the data. We ran three different tasks down these chains. One of them was building a tower out of spaghetti and Play-Doh. And actually what we're looking there is for the towers to get better and better because the first person is kind of experimenting. Ideally, the second person would learn a little bit from what they've observed, and so they start at a slightly higher level, and so on and so on. So we're looking at it from, from kind of an objective, scientific, data-driven way in the information transfer, from a, um, a personal experience way in the rapport measures, and then also how it looks to an outsider, both kind of naive outsider and a psychologist. What we found was that an information transfer between autistic people is just as effective as information transfer between non-autistic people. Now traditionally, the clinical diagnosis has been and still is that autism is at its core something that causes real deficits in communication with other people and social interaction. What we've found is that autistic people have just as good interactions with other autistic people as non-autistic people do. I mean, I think did the task quite well I and mean, it did bring out my competitive spirit <laughs> and that's what we were talking about <laughs> so who did make the tallest spaghetti tower? Can someone take this? <laughs> when we have autistic and non-autistic people together we see this drop in scores, this drop in rapport, this drop in data transfer. So two neurotypical people will experience relatively high rapport, two autistic people will experience relatively high rapport and a pair of autistic and neurotypical people will have a little bit lower. We found from kind of multiple lines of evidence in our research that it works well, that there, there is something that supports these interactions with other autistic people that makes them successful and enjoyable, it makes information transfer more accurate. That goes against this idea of a universal deficit in social cognition in autism. <laughs> I'm really engaged with a kind of concept called neurodiversity, which is essentially about differences in how our brains work are a natural part of variation, just like ethnic differences or gender differences. Just because there is a majority of people who perceive the world in one way, it doesn't mean that people with different kind of neurodivergences are wrong or impaired in the way that they perceive it. And so that would cover things within the neurodevelopmental family, such as autism and ADHD and Tourette's. To me, there's a very big sort of culture, societal shift that needs to happen. And that is one of we need to be more accepting of people, of people who are different. So judging and putting hierarchies about in according to how someone's moves and how normal or typical they are, it's very narrow. It's not, I don't think it's not healthy. And I think by trying to get society to be more accepting of people who are different. Yeah, so autistic people have said things like, um, you know, when I got my diagnosis and I met other autistic people, I felt much more comfortable. I felt much more confident in speaking to them. And I really felt like I'd found my tribe. They say, I'm forced to live in this world that is run by non-autistic people. I'm forced to learn how they interact. I'm forced to behave in a way that will suit them. And they don't actually understand me. Increasingly now, autistic people are setting up their own support networks and groups, after school clubs, buddy systems, that kind of thing. We don't want to 
put all the autistic people in a kind of ghetto and fence them off from the neurotypical community. But I think we do want to create opportunities for autistic people to be together on their own terms. There are some really clear practical recommendations that we can make. So for example, if you're going to have a lot of autistic kids in a school, you should be thinking about employing some autistic teachers. And there are so many autistic adults out there yeah. dying to share all this knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Why aren't we getting them in yeah. schools? Why aren't we sort of, you know, getting the parents to interact with us? People are scared of difference and the majority um, are used to being able to predict the people around them. But when it comes to somebody with a neuro neurological difference, people go, wait, I can't predict this person, therefore I'm scared. And it, it, it's reasonable to be scared and not be able to predict things because you don't really know what someone's going to do. But the problem when it comes to, say, um, the autistic population, for example, is that people start othering us. They start going, oh, well, this unpredictability must mean threat. This unpredictability must mean that they don't have any empathy. No, our motivations are completely understandable and not that complicated if you only listen to us. We might do things slightly differently, but the motivations make complete sense if you view them in a, a non-neurotypical context. I think there are some people who still kind of subscribe to the school of thought that, that autism is a universal deficit in social cognition. The fact that we did our study with autistic adults who are you know, articulate, independent, well-educated people. There will definitely be people in the autism community who feel that our results have limited relevance to, say, their child who needs a lot of support and wouldn't be independently participating in a study like this. And so we do need to develop our work to test whether this, we see the same patterns in that, in that part of the community and to make it relevant to, to those families. I think the main reason that we, we don't view autism as a disease is that we're not looking to cure it. We just want to kind of understand more about autistic people's lives and how we can improve them. But we're, we're nowhere near being able to rewire someone's brain. And if you were to rewire someone's brain, well, they wouldn't be them anymore. Because, you know, autism is a very implicit part of who someone is. It's not just about a bit of them that you can cure. Because it's not a disease, it's not cancer. It's not a little element, it's an implicit part of who someone is. We need to rethink what we mean by social deficits in autism because we have found that it is a selective deficit that occurs when interacting with non-autistic people. And that's a really important finding that goes at, you know, against some of the existing literature. We celebrate difference because it enriches our lives. Diverse groups of people create more creative solutions and have more fun together, I think. I think I'd like to see more autistic people being sort of very openly autistic in public and I think that's gradually going to filter out into society to the point where people have more of a clue and are then more able to kind of go, oh okay, that person's autistic. I'd like to see it be a bit like, you know, people being gay and it's not really an issue these days in, you know, this part of the world at least. And it's just, it's about acceptance. And but I think people need to meet autistic people for that to happen. I think we need lots of autistic role models. <laughs> oh, no, I'm <laughs>